chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. Putting God in a box. And I know what everybody's thinking, I wouldn't put God in a box. I put God in a box. So if I put God in the box, we all put God in the box. We all limit what God does. If we did, the Bible's very clear, if we had faith as small as a mustard seed, we can move mountains. God doesn't lie. Every one of us has a strain of unbelief and doubt running through our lives. How many of us have prayed and in the back of our mind, we really didn't think it would come through. We all, we all have. I mean, I've been there. Lord, uh, you know, I need you to meet this needs, but I, I, that might be a little big for you. You know, how ridiculous this looks. I, I found a cartoon, and I want Elena to show it to you. And it makes a whole lot of sense and makes us giggle. Go ahead and, there we go. Hey God, check out this awesome box I made for you to live in. Isn't that what we do? God, our problem is bigger than you can handle. We never say it out loud, but we think it. Sometimes we think it in the back of our, we think we have a big problem in life. And we're like, quickly but fleetingly going, will he do it? Instead of, he can do it. I know he can. But as I was reading the verses this week, I thought about a lot about farms. It's funny how the non-farming people, I'll put it that way, make horses and cows like animals. I have so many people, the biggest question I get asked why aren't your horses in blankets? Because my horses are from Friesland. And they have big blankets. You're more than welcome to comb them for the next six months. They are made for the cold. Trust me, I have put them in a barn and I found the barn door down and them out. It's almost like somebody puts an electric charge in them when the snow falls. They're going bananas. They love it. I have a lean-to. Do they use it? No. It's their personal toilet. That's it. I can't figure it. Raining, they stand outside. And I found out once I put a blanket on. And within two hours, it was on the ground, ripped off to shreds. So that tells me one thing. Why waste that money on something the horse doesn't need anyway? God created them with a whole lot more fur than I have. How do you think the horses, <clears throat> the Mustangs do in Wyoming and South Dakota? They've done just fine. But man says, they're cold. And they look at you going, have you seen this amount of sweat underneath a blanket that comes off a horse? That's why I like snuggling with them in the winter. They're like a heater. But man says this. What you're basically saying is the horse is not capable of using the natural gifts God's given them. And what we're saying is God is not able to do what we think. So I put my horse in a box in that 12 by 12 stall and this time around don't need a barn. They don't like a barn. They broke the doors. Tired of fixing doors. They want to be outside. God does not fit in a box. As much as we think about God I want him to approve of my plan. That's what we basically do. It's like us going to the city and say, approve of my plan. Isn't it funny that when the city says no, it doesn't meet our standards, we get mad. They're there. Some are ridiculous, I promise. But they're there mostly to tell you that doesn't meet code. We need you to comply to code. This code is there for safety. And putting a God in a box we're not understanding the box he wants us in. And his box is a whole lot bigger than the box we want to put in. But we do this as mankind. We'll assume someone 
just by looking at them, hearing them, or doing this, a lot of us by looks. You can't do that. I remember my wife. We were just married. And I took my wife, and I know I'm back home now in Canada, took my wife to buy a handgun. And she is a very, very good shot. Better than I was. And we went to a gun store. And I says, I want to buy my wife a Glock 23 40 caliber. And they looked at this little five foot tall, 100 pound girl and says, I'm sorry, you need this Ladysmith 38 and laid on the counter. And my wife looked at her, looked at the guy and laughed. And I said, sir, do you rent guns here? Yes, we do. We got a shooting range. I said, I'm going to rent that Glock 23 and give me a box of ammo. And we're going to go in this gun range and we're going to shoot. She went in there and everything, all 13 rounds was around the heart. We walked into the counter. We laid the gun the thing went down the road and bought another gun from another place. And the guy's just looking at her and looking at the gun and looking at the target going. Hope he worked on sales. Because I went down the road and I bought her a Glock 23. And yes, she still has it, but it's just not in Canada. <laughs> but the thing is, they assumed by seeing a short little girl that was petite that she could not handle that. However, you all know her father. He taught her everything. Just as my daughters, they look at them and say, well, they can't do that. They'll out sling a hay bale over any man any day. Most kids today would sling two hay bales and they're done. They're in there. We get the whole Ron Darling drops the hay bale off for us. And I mean, in the same day, we got it cleaned out and done. My girls are just like machines. Just because they wear a pretty skirt and smile doesn't mean they can't work. You know, the thing is, we assume Everybody puts someone in a box. And we do the same with God. I have seen elderly people outwork any 20 year old. And they'll look, you've got gray hair. Do you never underestimate a gray hair person? Because <laughs> they're in a generation that was completely different. We were working since the time we were kids. I was starting my first job at 12 years old, I didn't have time to play Nintendo. Didn't have a Nintendo. Didn't even know what it was. I think it was Atari and we were playing Pac-Man or something. On a, we all carried around those little football things, you know, about that big. But we didn't have what we did. We worked. God has been working in our lives for years and we still want to put him in a box. Israel forever put God in a box. God, you do what we want. God's like, I told you. I'm going to give you that land that you did not plow. Give you that land you did not plant. I'm going to give you the houses that you did not build. And they're like, mm, I don't know if God can get across the Jordan River. <laughs> then they look at Jericho. I don't know if God can do that. And you know what he's, God says? Just be quiet and walk. Think about this. What a dumb command for a military general to follow. Don't say a word. Walk around the city and go home. <laughs> Come back tomorrow at 7 o'clock, walk around the city again, come home. Come Wednesday, walk around the city. <laughs> seven days. But they get there at 7 o'clock on the seventh day and go, seven times you're going to walk around the city today. And now, on the seventh time, you're going to shout, and the city will fall. Now remember, this is the biggest city, the crown jewel of Canaan. Historians say Jericho was so big that houses, we know houses, were in the wall and they could ride chariots side by side on the top of the wall. We know Rahab lived on the outside of the wall because she let the spies down. Think about the city. And they did not fire one catapult. And they shouted and the walls came down. Extraordinary God. Time after time after time. God showed himself real. And we come to 2023. And are we not like some equestrians? Not going to look at the horse and say, you ever seen a Shetland ponies or a Welsh ponies fur? My goodness. I thought Frisians were bad sometimes. They love. 
they're like shaggy dogs. They're made. God gave them the attribute. Think about our animals. God gives everyone hibernation. Think about bears. Just, I, I love bears and how God has given them the ability to pack up, go to sleep for six months. Well, that'd be a nice job, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, put some fat on and go sleep it off and then come back out skinny and get hungry. Amen. <laughs> but God's in everything. He's got every animal situated perfect for the environment they're in. And he says, you know what? Don't worry. He gives us Matthew chapter 6. Don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will take care of itself. And what do we do? We wring our hands. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Don't worry about it. Don't let tomorrow's worry steal today's joy. And that's what we do by putting God in a box. We're not allowing him to work tomorrow or today. We're trying to be Mr. Fix-It, Mrs. Fix-It. We're trying to fix it now for God so he doesn't have to fix it. Let him fix it. Did it catch it by surprise or not? Putting God in a box, Ephesians chapter 3, look in verse 20 through 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundant. I love that word, exceedingly abundant. No, exceedingly abundantly. See, when you put abundant, you're limiting them. Abundantly. But here's what I love. Above all that we ask or think. But there's a comma there. Look at this next part. A lot of people don't want to see. According to the power that worketh where? In us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. According to the power that worketh in us. If you are a child of God, we have all of God we need. But let me ask you a question. Does God have all of you? That vessel that he can work through. I've done some plumbing in my life. And one reason we do not use in the plumbing world cast iron pipes anymore is they are known to corrode over time to where the hole gets smaller and smaller and smaller because the calcium buildup on the inside of the pipe is horrendous. I come back to Canada and we've used copper pipes. They pretty much did that away down there. When I was doing it, it was all PVC. Why? The way it's formulated, the way it's poured, it's easy to snake. It's easy, hard to clog because it's slick. And over time, they've tested and tested and tested to where water continues to flow with all the calcium and the fluoride, all the city people put in there. I'm glad I'm on the well, amen. But all that stuff does it. I was doing a job the other day and we had to change out over 35 feet of cast iron pipe because a restaurant was not getting its flow anymore. And when the plumber took a picture of it, there was less than of an eighth of an inch hole where the water was getting through in a half inch pipe. And you know what the, you know what the restaurant told me? We've never had this much water pressure in the 18 years we've rented the store. It, they were surprised. They blew them out. Their machines couldn't handle the pressure of the water. They'd turned up the machines to handle the water pressure, and now the water pressure came out and they were losing their machines. So they had to come back in there and turn. What a difference. The pipe looked the same, but what got inside was corrosion. The limitations of us is the sin inside or the unbelief inside limit the power of God. In the museum that I work in, a lot of the World War II vehicles have little slits on their headlights. Let me tell you, we all know the 1940s car did not have the brightest bulb in the box. But it's limited by even further having a little slit for the blackout lights. I don't know how they drove. I, I give them all Medal of Honors. 
I mean, they, they drove on these dirt roads with these little tiny lights. I like my LED lights, amen. I can see miles down the road, and it's great. But I'm looking at, we're looking at these little slit lights, oh, wow. But you know what? You took off that lens, and you have a little bit more light. That's what we're doing in Christianity, is we're letting God shine through little boxes, little cracks, and going, I got God inside of me. Look what all he's doing. Just imagine if we take the cap off and let the light shine. Just imagine if we take the corrosion of sin out of our lives and put a real half inch pipe with no junk inside. And people are like, wow, what has got into you? It's always been there. I just not have utilized the power. As we think about our limited thinking this morning, we could sometimes forget that God can do immeasurable miracles more than we can ever think. I can't even process. The Bible says here we can't even process or even think about asking what he can do. And the question I have for me and our church tonight this morning is why do we limit the power that work is in us? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, Help us, O oh Lord, to reflect in our life. As David says, search me and try my reins. Try my heart, O oh Lord. May I ask a question. Why do I limit the power of God that lives within me? Is it my unbelief? Is it my lack of faith? Is it my lack of courage? Or is it a lack of surrender? Lord, help me to tap into that unlimited power from the God of heaven that the world might see and exalt you for who you are. Thank you for all you've done for us and all that you're going to do. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We are so focused many times in churches on the goodness of God. We're focused on his love. We're focused on certain attributes and it's great we need to talk about the love of God we need to talk about the goodness of God we need to talk about the faithfulness of God but we also need to talk why don't we utilize it no one really wants to say I'm guilty y'all are guilty I know it but me I don't know about that you know that's the way we do it's like everybody else I am this I am that but are we do we utilize the power that worketh in us? And I honestly got to say, looking at the Christendom today, no. We are using an eighth of an inch of that power. We are no different than that pipe in that restaurant that has been there for decades and no one ever thought about sending a camera down it to see the corrosion that has come from the city water plants. I don't know what it is about cast iron, but it, they are just a magnet for calcium. They just are. That's why the plumbing industry, that's why all across this world, they're changing the codes because this was a problem. The restaurant manager told me, just can't imagine I'm making coffee with that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, it just makes your tummy. I mean, it was gross. And people are drinking that. Just think about what people are seeing of Christ through the limitations of what did we show them. Oh, your God's not a big God. He is. Question they're going to ask us, then why don't we see him? God gets blamed for all the trouble in the world. I was saying in Sunday school, a gentleman was blaming God for all the bad luck he's having. I said, first of all, it's not luck. But after our conversation, I got him to admit that who made the choices? Did God or him? And he had to admit, I did. So you're going to blame a person that's not even your father for your problems. That's like you blaming my father for you and he's not your father and you're not his son. They had to realize once I had to bring it out to that aspect that I'm blaming Abe for all my problems. And Abe was like, what did I do? 
I didn't even know you until four or five years ago. You know, that, that's the thing. It's like, really? It's all everybody else's fault. We're going to blame God because we're putting him in a box that says, that makes me feel good that we're going to blame him for all our problems. But the Christians are putting him in the box and say, God, this is my plan for my life. Isn't it nice? Now get in it. God says, I got so much bigger plans for you. But you're so narrow-minded. We talk about that. The older generation, we know this. We call them narrow-minded individuals. In other words, they're tunnel vision. They don't see the grand scope of things. Some of us, our dad, our parents taught us when we were growing up to look at the big picture. How many's heard that terminology? The big picture. Everybody looks at, well, I don't see it. Think big. When we were February 2013, when we came into this sanctuary on that cold February day, I heard several of the people going, I don't see what you see, Pastor. You're right. That's why I'm Pastor. <laughs> You're the member. <laughs> I have a big picture. I see this. But you know what sadly was? Many of them didn't stick around to see the finished vision. They assumed they didn't see past the scaffolding. Bob, you know what I mean. Sometimes they don't see the rock work that you envision. I imagine this one going here, this one here. I love laying bricks. I would pick the most unusual ones down at the bottom and, and all of most people just go boom, 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 never think about it. Man, I look at the bricks, I look at the rock and go, I like this one here. I want this focal point here. I like this. Why? Unique. But people are like, why are you doing that? Just wait and see. Just wait and see. That's what God wants to do. It's like, God, I, I don't like the way you're laying my life. I think it ought to go this way. God's like, who's the master builder? Let, let step back. I've already seen the beginning and the end. I've seen the alpha and I've seen the omega because that's me. I know what it's supposed to look like. No, 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 God. I want it to look like this. I remember I was laying brick for uh, culverts and the culvert came out of the drain and, and the city wanted it, the culvert coming out of the drain to look very nice because it was coming into a park and I had an idea how I wanted to look so it would be unique because it was going into a very swanky part of Atlanta so it was like I wanted the culvert to be multicolored brick very nice tasteful the foreman comes along and goes that's going to take too long I like it like this and I've got a guy perfect for this the guy couldn't lay brick more than I could breed dogs. And city of Atlanta inspector came and said, this is not what I envisioned at all. Take it all out. So the foreman says, Gordon, what was your idea? So I sat there and I explained to the city official what I wanted to do, how I wanted to alternate the color bricks. He said, I like it. I'm not a great bricklayer, but I had an idea where make it nice. He said make it nice, not all red. Alternate it. But this is the things in life. Step back. See the big picture. God wants you to see what he can do in Christianity. What he can do. But the first thing I want you to see, our limited belief equates limited power. Do we really, 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 really believe God can do it? If not, why don't we let him? Step back and let God. Let go and let God. The problem is you want to hang on to it. You want to do this. But in buying this building, in remodeling the building, Ray will tell you he was here on the ground floor. It didn't look like much for many, 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 many months. It was just broken lath and plaster and a whole lot of dust. When we tore up the floor, underneath it was not very pretty. Then the air conditioning people came in and tore up the floor more. We had pipes going everywhere. It was like, you had to see, this is what we wanted. You know what? It took s several years before we started seeing normality. But look where we are today. Looking at blueprints is different than looking at a finished product, but you have to have a vision. And that's where Proverbs said, without a vision, people perish. 
without a vision, what do we see for our community? What do you see for your life? What do you see as an adult? We impact more than just our family. We impact the community around us. What do they see of God? We ought to have so much power, we're blowing the machines. The coffee machines no longer could handle it because they kept tweaking it so it could have the, so many drips per minute. The problem is, the pipe was not delivering what it could. It says half inch pipe. And it was less than an eighth of an inch. That's a lot of loss. And so Bun was coming and adjusting these things and all of a sudden, the dripping was just like, Phew. there was too much water coming into the hoppers. They're not used to that. We ought to saturate the world with the power of God. Can you imagine Jericho's soldiers? <laughs> this is funny. These guys are morons. I thought they had a great God behind them. There were some that were afraid, the Bible says. Their hearts melted. You know what they realized? The more it went on, something is about to happen and we don't like it. They didn't know what it was. I can just hear them saying, there's some weird mumbo jumbo going on here. There, we're we're going to be in trouble. Would that not unnerve you to have hundreds of thousands of people march around your city and not say a word? And all you hear is the shuffling and the rattling of swords in a sheath. I'll be honest, that would get on my nerves really quick. That'd make me almost real freaky. But here's the thing. Can you imagine that last day when the trumpet sounded and the men shouted and that wall started shaking? Those chariots, where were they to go? The people inside those walls. But wouldn't it have been more unnerving to see one section of the wall not so much as a seismic burp. And there was a red line hanging down it. Can you imagine? Here's, here is Rahab's house. Everything falls flat. And here's her house standing. I would love to have been the soldier on top of the house. Amen. <laughs> but this is the God that they served. Think about when the giants came. Caleb, I want that mountain. 88 years old. Him and his three sons go up on that mountain and take the giants. Why? He believed God could. God is a giant killer. David, a teenager, takes a rock and he takes a sling just as God commanded him to. And he says, I don't need your sword. I don't need your shield. I don't need your breastplate, Saul. I have God. When you look at that faith, that faith of that young man says, I will not put God in a box. I will not say, I need a sword. I need a spear to fight this giant. That giant is desecrating the name of God, and I don't like it. That's why he told his brothers, is not God. What a good question. What is God to us? Is not God a big God? And you look at this. Time after time, he told the disciples, Oh, you a little faith. Lord, we can't cast out demons. He come back, not with a theological discourse. He says, this only comes forth with prayer and fasting. Very simple verse. Get on your knees. Pray for God's power because you're not doing it on your own. Simple as that. Just imagine if we prayed believing. Just imagine if we prayed expecting. Just imagine if we prayed surrendered. The power that works in us. The problem is we're only giving God this much of our life. Saying, okay God, I'll let you have this. But I want this. 
Matthew chapter 13, verse 58. Turn with me there. Matthew 13, 58. On November 20th, 2003, while I was in Quito, Ecuador, I was running from the Lord since I was 16, uh, preaching the gospel. And one of the preachers was preaching, and he talked about that very thing of giving God, and he took a blank piece of paper off the pulpit, and he says, when we are born of God, not born, born, but born of God, he gives us a clean slate. Everything past is washed clean. Everything forward is anew. It's a clean whiteboard. And he says, basically, we tell God, I don't have a clean piece of paper, but anyway, that's a blank canvas. But then we start looking at that blank canvas and we go, hmm, what can I draw? How can I want my new life to be? And he says, we start drawing. And then we make a big mess of it and there's one little corner that's still not and we tear it off and say, here God, see what you can do. I'll take this big blank canvas and I'll doodle on it like a two-year-old and I'm going to give you the corner to make a masterpiece. It's amazing what God can do with the corner of our life, amen? And that hit me that night because that's exactly what I've done. When God called me to preach in 1988 in Faith Baptist Church of Chilliwack, I basically said, nope. I have my own doodle of life. And preaching is not in it. You know when God got my life back at 31? It was a mess. It was a train wreck. Little train wreck. It's amazing what he's been able to do with the corner of my life. What if God got me at 16 instead of 31? What if God was allowed to really work in a masterpiece? How much more I would have to been less regretful of. And Matthew 13, 58 says, And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Capernaum did not want to believe God was God. Matthew 17, 20. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Mark, he says again, in verse 6 of chapter 6, And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went around about the village's teaching. He marveled. We, we as adults sometimes we marvel at our world's lack of common sense. We're like, really? Who ever thought we would have to put hot tea, hot coffee on our cup? I didn't order cold coffee. Who had ever thought Winnebago would have to put this vehicle does not include autopilot? Who had ever thought Dodge would have to put in my manual, do not drink the battery fluid? I've never had no intention to drink the battery fluid. Really? Some of the things out there, they're going to be put, do not light firecrackers in your hand. I knew that from the time I was four. I don't light firecrackers in my hand. But the people today, don't only eat the Tide Pods. Our world has changed and it's become, and we're going, the word we would use today is unbelief, really. Jesus marveled at their unbelief. He healed their sick. He fed the 5,000. He healed the dumb. And they're still like, yeah, I don't believe it. <laughs> Can you, 
How would you do, if you saw Jesus Christ in our midst, and he's in our midst, but physically in our midst, and he came and touched each one of you for her ailments, and that was gone completely. Lazarus was raised from the dead, and they still didn't believe it. Lazarus come forth, but Lord, he stinketh. Yes, he does. <laughs> but now he's alive. And the Pharisees like, yeah, I don't believe it. No wonder Jesus walked away and went. But how many times does he say today, look and live? Yeah, no. I don't think looking at that brazen serpent is going to make me live. Simple. Look and live. Jesus has never made anything complicated. I am glad he's left the cookies on the bottom shelf for me. He's left it on my level. He's left it on your level because he wants it accessible to all. Just imagine faith as a grain of mustard seed. Lori, years ago, taught at a ladies' meeting here at Community, and she actually ordered mustard seeds from Israel and taped it on a three by five card. You could see the tape, you could see the card, but you had to look really, really, really close for the mustard seed. You know what Jesus is saying? You just have to have the itty bitty little one. You know what I have to say sometimes? I don't even have that much faith. Because if I did, more things would happen. But I'm guilty of when I pray begin doubting before it happens. Have I seen God work? <laughs> yeah. Why haven't you learned? I'm slow. I've seen God work. It's not that I haven't. That's where the Bible says in straight way after he appeared unto the leaven as they sat and meat and unbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. They still did not marry. <laughs> I love you young lady but you really didn't see Jesus. Oh yes I did. You, no wonder they were so afraid when he popped in the upper room. They were not believing he was alive. They did not believe that he had actually, they heard Mary, they heard Peter and John, but God had not showed himself to them yet. They saw the empty tomb. Only one that seen it was Mary. She said, I have seen the risen Savior. Calm down. Just, you're a woman. I could just see that right now. You're a woman. Looking at my wife. Yeah, you can't handle that. Watch me. Don't ever tell my wife she can't not do something. That's just red flag and bowl. <laughs> Don't tell people they can't do stuff. That's what my dad says. There is no can't in your vocabulary. I may do it and not do it well, but I still did it. <laughs> there are some things I've learned I will never do again. I am not a carpenter. If you want a leaning house of pizza, that's me. You can call me. There are some things I can do. There's some things I can't. I know my limitations. But doesn't mean I won't try. I am not an auto mechanic. I promise you I am not an auto mechanic. I'll fix what I need to. But yeah, I'm not an auto mechanic. Because I'm usually looking at four bolts left over and going, hmm, guess I didn't need them after all. <laughs> you know, the thing is, we know our limitations. But so does God. And he says that. I can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Their hardness and unbelief hindered them from believing. After Jesus told them for three years, I'm going to die and rise again. No. no. Romans 3 and verse 3. Romans 3 and verse 3. I love this verse and this should remind us about God. 
Romans 3, verse 3, For what if some did not believe? Good question. Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? <laughs> is their unbelief going to stop the faith in God is real? No. I love Romans chapter 4, verse 20. Talking about a 75-year-old man named Abraham. We all heard of him. The father of the Jews. God comes to him. Now he is a Babylonian. He is about five to 800 kilometers away from where God's to lead him. And he comes to him and says, Abraham, I know you don't worship me. I know you don't know me. But I'm the God of Israel. I'm the God. I am that I am. Think about this. Abraham didn't know much about God. And all of a sudden God appears to him and says, I want you to follow me. I want you to pack up your stuff, your home, your family. Go tell Sarai, your wife, we're going on a journey. Where am I going, Lord? I'll show you when you get there. Guys, I promise you our wives will think we're crazy if we came and said, we're going on a trip. Where are we going? I don't know. We're just driving. We'll know when we get there. Neither my wife and I like to go anywhere without a plan. We like to know where our destination at. We like to plan. But he said, we're going. We're packing up everything we have. We're leaving this land that we've known for the last 75 years and we're moving to place because God told me. Who? God. They left. But look what chapter 4 verse 20 says. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He staggered. You know what that means? Stumbled. We've all stumbled along in life, but he didn't even stumble. He didn't even falter. He said, yes, we're moving. And God moved that family all the way until he says, now, you see the boundaries? That's yours, that's yours, that's yours, that's yours, that's yours. I promise you. You know what man has said? That's not Israel's. We're going to cut this out. That's Israel's. When I read the Bible, Israel's blueprint is massive. When I see God's blueprint versus man's, man's blueprint, here's Israel. Uh -uh. It's not what God promised them. But man says, no, 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 I don't like that. I'm going to cut it out and carve it out. This is God's people. No, you're not. As I read a Jew the other day, he was talking about, he's a born again Jew, and he says, God's map is already settled in heaven. They're just squatting. I like that. God's plan. Just like they, the world cannot tell you our home is not heaven. They can't take it away from us. They tell you, ah, oh, you know, fairy tales. It's a pie in the sky, man upstairs. I've heard it all. Yeah, you do whatever you want. But it's not deviating from the plan that God has for me, absent from the body, present with the Lord. I don't care what you say. I know, because I have hope that's anchored within the veil. Just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's not real. And that's exactly what Romans is saying. Just Really? For what if some do not believe? Can you imagine how many people looked at Henry Ford and went, huh? Or Mr. McLaughlin? Or the Wright brothers? You're going to fly? You mean we're go you're, you're, your plan is to go over the Atlantic? Are you serious? Yep, I'll be over the Atlantic in about four and a half hours. Thank you. Not month. Every person came out, and, Mr. Bell. Yeah, we're going to be able to call our mother and father across the country. You know, in the busiest time for any telemarketing or tel telephone company in the world is Mother's Day. Thanks to Mr. Bell, phones across the world are going to be lit up saying Happy Mother's Day. But when he invented it, they laughed at him. Thomas Edison says, hey, we're not going to need lanterns anymore. Yeah, they'll never take off. Praise the Lord. <laughs> we have lights. And this is the thing. Just because someone doesn't believe it doesn't mean it's not true. God gives us chances. And our limited belief 
does not negate the fact that God is unlimited in power. He's the power that worketh in us. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. It is a constant battle to fight that negative in us. It is a constant battle to make sure our pipes are not clogged up with sin of unbelief and lack of faith. So we see that could not enter in because of unbelief. Hebrews 13 or 319. So we see that could not enter in because of unbelief. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 6 the Bible says seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in therein and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Many people, as the serpent on the pole, they were just to look and live. We've all been bit by some manner of animal in our life. It hurts. It burns. But can you imagine being bit by a snake and that adder poison running through you? Paralysis setting in. And the Lord saying to Moses, Build a brazen serpent, put it on a pole where all can see, and tell them, look and live. Simple. Look and live. And yet, no, I, I just, that just sounds like hocus pocus. No, that doesn't sound very scientific. <laughs> oh, that doesn't sound like that. I, can you hear all the naysayers? Can you imagine a young child? It works, Dad. Dad, it works. My bite's healed. I feel great. No, son, just leave me alone. That's just garbage. Mom, look, it works. That doesn't make any sense. Doesn't have to make sense, does it? God said it, so do it. Walking around a city seven times doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Walking up to a dead man after three days and saying, arise, didn't make a whole lot of sense. Telling a man, I'm going to spit, make some mud, plaster it on your eyes, and go down and wash. You're going you're to spit in mud, dirt, and you're going to put it on my eyes and I'm going to see. Do you see some of the miracles Jesus did took a whole lot of faith? Really did. God wants to test our faith to whether we have that manner of obedience. That surrender is key. That man had to sit there completely blind while Jesus made mud out of his own spittle and placed it on his eyes and said, go wash in the pool of Shalom and you'll be healed. Gentlemen, let me ask you how you'd respond. First, someone's going to spit, make mud, plaster it on your face, and you're going to walk down to the local watering hole and wash it off. I'll tell you, I'll be a little skeptical. I'm just honest. Arise, take up your bed and walk. But Lord, I've tried that. But Lord, no man's there for me. I've done that. doesn't work. Throughout the Bible, God was showing he does not need a box. He gave us an open boundary of life. Why? Why? Because the Bible says unlimited surrender is unlimited power. Think about the power we might have through surrender. Look in Colossians chapter 1. Look what Paul says. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 29. Colossians 1 29. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. 
whereunto I also labor, striving according to His working, which worketh in me mightily. If we let God work through us, it's just going to be amazing what God can do. How do we know we are where we need to be? The power of the Word. I'm going to give you three powers in closing this morning. Power of the Word. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Do you not therefore err, because you know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God. He tells in Mark, Do you not, do ye not therefore err? Are you not making a mistake? Because you know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God. The reason we err so much is we're not where we should be. Do we not know God's Word? He cannot lie. This Bible says if I have a grain of a mustard seed, that much faith, I can have the mountain moved. I don't think the Lord was just saying it as a little parable or He was literally saying, where's your faith? Think about this. The faith of Peter allowed him to walk on water at a request. If it's thine, O Lord, allow me. Bid me to come. Come. He didn't step out on a perfect glass covered sea. He stepped out in the middle of a storm. The boat was sinking and he got out and he walked. And the only reason he sank is because he took his eyes off Jesus Christ. Casting out demons, healing the sick, only comes forth was fasting and praying. He says, you can do it. You can do great things through him. Just imagine the prayers that would be answered. Just imagine the impact across this world starting in Hampton if we would become more than an eighth inch Christians. The world couldn't handle, those coffee makers could not handle it. They were a set for that pressure that was coming off that little bitty hole. And they never even thought to repressurize the machines right. And they turned that valve on and poof, water went everywhere again. Machines could not handle the pressure. As I've said this, John Knox was greatly feared by Mary, Queen of Scots, because of his prayer. Not because of his fighting, not because of his wit, not because of his good looks, not because of his, what he did for the Bible, because of his prayer. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's quick and powerful. It divides the soul and spirit. It goes down to the joints and the marrow. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Word of God is more powerful than we can even imagine. But think about this. Not only the power of word, the power of prayer. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. The Bible says Elijah was just like us. He had the power of prayer. We have proven in scriptures in the past week. Elijah prayed and it rained. Elijah prayed and it didn't rain. We've seen God work. I mentioned Brother Ferguson last week. If you believe it's going to, if you're praying for rain, bring your umbrella. Have faith. Show God you actually believe it. But through our own actions, we say we don't really believe it. Well, I'm just coming up. I'm going to pray for rain, but I'm not bringing an umbrella because I'm going to look stupid. That's basically what it is. You know, what would people say? I believe God. So they're going to make fun of you. When it's raining, that look on Brother Ferguson, when he popped that umbrella going out to his car, it was like, <laughs> sorry you didn't believe. We got wet, he got the car dry, him and Mr. Ernestine. Here's the thing. He had faith. If God will answer our prayer, don't you think he'll answer everyone's that prays in his will? That's a child of God. Here's the key. You have to be a child of God. Because the Bible doesn't hear the prayer of sinners. 
you have to be right with God because God, if we regard iniquity in our heart, He will not hear us. So there's some criteria for that power. But if we pray according to His will and we pray our life like a clean PVC pipe that's half inch with no corrosion, we got the power inside. It'll surprise a few people. Amen? That's what God wants that they will give Him glory and honor. Prayer, the power of prayer will bring the answer on the way. But finally this morning, here's something we may forget about. The power of the Holy Ghost inside us. We can't do anything without Him. He is that power. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus Christ before his ascension says disciples go and pray. He didn't say okay guys y'all commissioned y'all get out there and do it. Nope he says go pray. The Bible doesn't say exactly how long they prayed but they prayed until the place was shaken with power and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and they went out God endued them with that power and Peter preached in such a way that they thought he was drunk they'd never seen Peter preach that way before can you imagine the passion that burned from within that man can you imagine the power of the voice that he had that the multitudes there was so enthralled by him and every language heard it in their language. Talk about the power of God. Peter didn't know any other language. He, did, he was a Jew, not a Gentile. He knew Hebrew. But who do you think creates the minds and hearts of man? God Almighty. He caused them to hear in their own language. 3,000 men were saved and added to the church. What a day that was. But what if they went ahead of God? They wouldn't have seen the results. Think about the next time in Acts chapter 5 they prayed. The place was shaken. God began to mightily work. Thousands more were saved. It's not just a one time revival that someone gets up and starts singing and then everybody starts saying oh yeah this. No. There was no singing in Peter's voice. There was all preaching. And it wasn't you read Acts chapter 2. It wasn't very You are the guys that crucified Christ. It went straight down the line. He came and he died for you. And you crucified him. He came to live for you. And you didn't like him. And they were pricked at the heart. The Bible says. The Bible says. The power of the Holy Ghost is the key. To being an effective Christian. It is the key. You cannot, you can get into this building in many ways. But the best way is if you use the key and come through the front door. The key unlocks great potential. You will never fully witness, fully preach the gospel, fully live the Christian life without the power of the Holy Ghost. Romans 15 and verse 13. Final verse this morning. Romans 15 and verse 13. Verse 15 through 13, or uh, chapter 15, verse 13 says, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of of the Holy Ghost. Notice he's going to fill us with joy, peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. The power of the Holy Ghost will fill our life with joy. As that all, all song says, joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's what, when we sing that song, you know, you think about the joy unspeakable and full of glory. The peace that passes all understanding. 
when the world's shaken up, when the world is about worried about financial collapse, when the world's worried about this, when the world's worried about that, I'm not. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, I'm just traveling on through. Through the ages, the nature and character of God has been described in countless ways. Holy, compassionate, merciful, gracious, loving, faithful, forgiving, just to name a few. Yet as Pastor Charles Stanley, who just passed away a few weeks ago, pointed out in his book, The Gift of Love, there is one essential character trait that all humanity can celebrate giving. We have life only because God has created us by an exercise of His will. We can receive salvation because of His finished work on the cross of Calvary. Because of His finished work on the cross of Calvary and His will grants it to us. God's will is none that should perish, but all should come to Him. God's ever-giving heart allows us to approach Him incredibly. Let us not make the mistake of putting limitations on God. That's like putting Him into a box. Instead, remember that we serve a mighty God who grants us the power of His Word, prayer, and the ever-present Holy Spirit to help us each step of the way. Don't limit what God can do through you. Don't doubt what God can do with you. That's why I say, God, how can you use me? Well, a few years later, it's amazing looking back and saying, that was a dumb question. God's done a lot. Is he finished with me? No. Is he finished with you? Thank God he's not. I'm glad he's not done with any of us. You know what? They've, we are just like that pipe. God will still keep flowing through us, even if he's limited. But wouldn't it be a whole lot better if he flowed through us unlimited? It delivers all, you know what? The manager laughed. He goes, Gordon, the water doesn't taste so, and I heard him on the other end of the phone. Can you imagine drinking water in a mountain town in Colorado out of a iron pipe that's filled with calcium? I bet his coffee tastes better today. But you know what? Unless we didn't have a problem, we would have never fixed the pipe. Sometimes God brings problems in our life to show himself real. He brings problems in our life to, what does the Bible says? The preaching of the word of God is there to correct, to rebuke, to instruct in all righteousness. Sometimes he, well, most of the time he brings stuff in my life so I can get closer to him and open his word and go, mm, we need a little road rooting, amen? We need to get a little clean more because I want to flow through you. I want to use you more than you're using. I want to use your full potential. And that's the thing is, you know, most people don't see that pipe. They'll never see that pipe in that back room. But they'll see the effect of the pipe. He says, the toilets flush better. The sinks wash better. The water flows great all throughout the restaurant. It's amazing what a half inch clean pipe does. What can a little country boy that was born in a small port of Oregon and lived in British Columbia can do for God. What did he do with Hudson Taylor? What did he do with C.T. Studd, D.L. Moody, Charles Spurgeon? It's amazing what he can do with us if we just but let him. Will we surrender to his will this morning? Will we give him our whole life and say, God, here's all of me, not some of me? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you. God, you are a great giver of life. You've given us eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. When we deserve the wages of sin is death and a Christless departure from you. Lord, help us. As we focus on the message that was preached this morning to contemplate how much has he given of us? How much has he allowed to flow through us? How many years of buildup of things that need to be cleaned? 
How many habits do we need to give? How much do we need to say, Lord, I can't fix it. I'm so glad, Lord, you can put new pipes in. I'm so glad, Lord, that you can do many great things. Help us, O Lord. Surrender to you in all that's said and done. That we may be a mighty vessel where the world will see the power of God in our lives. And give you glory and honor. Thank you for each and every one here this morning. Those who are online. Use this message and this service. To challenge our lives in the days and years ahead. And Lord we ask you to dismiss with your blessing. Bring us back this evening as we meet to pray. And to preach again on Third John or 2 John. Lord thank you. In Jesus precious name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. May the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing each and every one of you at 4.30 tonight for prayer and 5 o'clock for worship service. Lord bless and have a great afternoon.